Hey everyone, welcome to our new unit, Oceans, Atmosphere, and Climate. At this point, you should have already taken the pretest um, for this for this chapter, and you also should have taken the test for the weather pattern unit. Some of the information from the weather pattern is going to play um, is going to be pretty important for this unit, but I'm going to review it if um, just because I know there are some people that were still a little confused on some of the topics. Now. What's different about this unit than our other units is that we normally have a workbook to go along with this. But as I said before in the past, that the online platform is almost identical um, to the questions in the workbook. So, so I'm going to log on to Amplify. Now, I'm already logged in. If you need any help getting onto your Amplify account, just let me know because I have to give you your clever password. Um, your ID number is your username and your password is going to be something that you set, but I can change it if you need to. Now, normally, if you enter through Google Classroom, um, it's going to bring you right to the lesson that I'm talking about. But just so that you guys know, we are on this one, Ocean, Atmosphere, and Climate. So that's how you're going to start. Now I want to go over our coding just so that um, for those that don't remember, we can get to it. I'm going to go back to the presentation. Now, normally um, I code everything with U, a number, C, a number, L, a number, which stands for unit, chapter, and lesson. If you go into Amplify, you will see that we are on unit six. One, two, three, four, five, six. We are also starting again, chapter one. So C1, U6, C1. And right now we are on lesson two. Even though it's the first real lesson of the unit, the first lesson is actually the pretest, which you guys should have already taken. So this is where we're gonna start. Now, some suggestions to making this a little easier for yourself would be that this is used on a computer and that you use the cell phone to watch the video that goes with the lesson. If that's not possible, you can have two tabs open here with the YouTube channel and then curriculum up here. If you're using a cell phone to do the entire lesson, I um, highly suggest that you get um, a notebook. If you don't have a notebook, that's fine. You could take a couple pieces of paper, staple them, and then on each page that you're working on, write down the code um, for the lesson so that you could go back and write the answers in on your cell phone so that you're not confused. Now, this, ta uh, this simulator for this unit is not available as an app on the tablet or cell phone. But um, again, I'm going to be doing all the experiments and simulators on my videos so you could get the data that way if you cannot do it on your cell phone. So just to recap again, unit, chapter, lesson. And now I will always post it on the intro to the, the, the lesson page um, as again, unit, chapter, lesson. Today's lesson is what determines the air temperature of a location. Now I've already posted on Google Classroom you should already be on this page when you get up. Oh, sorry. This is the page that you should be looking at when you enter through Google Classroom. If you're not, again, the best way to go about this, we're in Unit 6, Chapter 1, Lesson 2. And we're going to start with the warm-up. So at this time, I want you to compare the average temperatures for each of the two cities shown below. Then answer the question below the picture. I'm going to go back to my slides just because I already have it nicely organized there. And at this point, you can follow along. And I'm going to be switching back and forth between the Amplify site and here so you know where to submit your answers. So compare the average temperature for each of the two cities shown on the map. Then answer the question below the image. What ideas do you have about what makes Anchorage, Alaska cooler than Christchurch, New Zealand? 
So we're going to be working with these two areas pretty frequently during this unit. And I want to point out some key ideas here is that one, that Christchurch, New Zealand and Anchorage, Alaska are pretty much in the same longitudinal section. If I drew a line, they are not that far like away on going up and down. Um, what they are far away is going, going from horizontal. So, and then if I look at the temperatures, Alaska has a temperature of three degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Fahrenheit, which is almost um, basically freezing. Whereas Christchurch, New Zealand is closer to 11 degrees Celsius or 54 degrees. Um, both of these temperatures, um, they're not that far apart, but they are significant as far as how you would dress for these occasions. So press pause and answer the question. And you're going to answer the question on Amplify because they will actually show me your answers on here. So when you type your answer here, you're going to click Next Activity. Okay, welcome back. I'm going to introduce the unit question before we actually get started with the video. Normally I say it after the video, but let's just get started with the unit question. Now this is the question we're going to talk about for all the chapters in this unit. And it's what determines the air temperature of a location on Earth? So if we're looking again at Anchorage and um, Christchurch, um, New Zealand, what determines whether it's going to be an average temperature of 11 degrees or 3 degrees Celsius? In the video, you will meet scientists who will research, who are researching air temperature in different places and what it, and that, what can make the temperature change. So I'm going to play the video on here as well, but if you wanted to stop and watch the video on, um, on Amplify, you could do that too if you wanted a slightly better coverage. I'm Marty Hurling. I'm a climate scientist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Boulder, Colorado, and I study El Nino. El Nino has some puzzling aspects to it. It lasts six, 12 months. It returns maybe every two to seven years. When El Nino happens, the ocean temperatures change and the air temperatures change over the whole planet. And they can change by Oh, almost two tenths of degrees Celsius, almost a half degree Fahrenheit. And that kind of change, you might say, well, that's not very big, but actually it is big and we can see it happening. El Nino is something that causes radical changes. Some places get way too much rain and they get flooded out and it can be damages to homes. Some areas that normally get rain, suddenly the rain shut down. They get fires, drought, their crops don't grow, a lot of problems. We had this big El Nino this past year. It was so big that we decided within NOAA to go out and hunt it down, take new measurements to see how it ticked. We combine planes, ships, we go to remote islands, we launch balloons. My name is Dan Wolf. I'm a research meteorologist and I was part of the El Nino Rapid Response Project the ship traveled from Hawaii to the equator, collecting ocean temperature and also releasing weather balloons as we went. The data are transmitted real time back to a computer on the ship where we can watch it. Then we can send it back to Boulder where modelers use it to help better understand the weather and El Nino. I'm Dr. Leslie Harton. I'm a research meteorologist and this spring I spent five weeks on a small island called Christmas Island in the equatorial Pacific. And we went there to launch weather balloons. Christmas Island is in a part of the world where there are almost no regular weather observations. And it's also right at the heart of the El Nino that was happening this year. We launched our weather balloons at 1.15 in the morning and 1.15 in the afternoon. An instrument package like this is attached to the weather balloon. And as the balloon goes up, we measure temperature and humidity and winds and pressure. 
Our data give us a really unique picture of how the atmosphere is behaving in that region when there is a strong El Nino. Hey, Honolulu's is Boulder, and we're ready to go through the briefing this morning. So every day, um, the aircraft would have to fly out from Hawaii to the equator to get some idea of what El Nino was doing. Kelly, do you expect both radars on board to be active to help you um, through that convection? Yeah, thanks, Marty. We should have both radars working on today's flight, so that will be a big help. I'm Dr. Kelly Mahoney, and I served as a mission scientist for the El Nino Rapid Response Project aboard the NOAA Research Aircraft. We had manned aircraft with the whole flight crew aboard it, and then an unmanned aircraft. And the mission of both of these aircrafts was to go out and get close enough to thunderstorms that we could either circle around them or get close enough to feel some of the winds that were coming out of them. As we got close to the thunderstorms, our job was to drop instrument packets out of the airplane to measure the temperature, moisture, and wind speeds right around the thunderstorms. The data that we collected is truly unique and very useful and valuable to our weather and climate models. So I really like doing this science um, because we're trying to understand the way El Nino works. The ocean and the atmosphere, how they link, it affects weather patterns. Many people's lives are really affected by this. And that's really why the data are so important. It helps us make better forecasts and helps people's lives. Okay, so before we start, I want to introduce the idea of climate. Um, Climate is the general weather pattern over a longer period of time. So our last unit was actually called weather patterns. And we talked about weather being a specific time and place. When we describe weather, if someone were to ask you the weather, they're talking about the time and place of where you're located or the location that they mentioned. Climate is actually the average, the what is normal for that season. So you'll see people talk about climate change or um, the idea that the environment is not as it once was. And we talked about this earlier when before we went to online learning about how weather, even within my lifetime, has been visibly different. Um, and this is what we talk about over time. So when we talk about weather of a location, we could talk about weather in seasons, we could talk about weather in decades and so forth, but we're talking about a time period. So this is a letter from Kiri Patra um, to you guys, the student climatologist. Now, a climatologist is a scientist who studies climate, which is what we're going to be during this time, during this unit. Climate scientist or climatologist, because ologist means study, studier is somebody who studies the differences and the data about how climate is reacting to certain things inside of an environment or if there is a change. So climatologists are actually quite popular in current science um, um, forefronts because of climate change and all the issues around that. So this letter is to you guys, um, the student climatologists. And it says, I am the director of the New Zealand Farm Council. An organization, re our organization represents farmers in the area surrounding Christchurch. Every few years, we notice climate changes that affect the crops. During El Nino years, the air temperature is much cooler than usual, and we would like to learn why. So the farmers are better, so the farmers are better prepared for these temperature changes. We are asking you, our student climatologists, to conduct some research on what determines Christchurch air temperature, especially when it decreases during El Nino. Looking forward to, to working with you and hearing what you find out. Well, like always, um, this is not a real organization. The New Zealand Farm, Farm Council is not real, but the data we're actually looking at compared to other times is actually very accurate, especially that um, we have actually just exited in the last very recently an El Nino. So a lot of this data that we're coming from is actually from the last event of El Nino. So what we're looking at here is during El Nino years, why is Christchurch, New Zealand's air temperature cooler 
than usual. Now, remember what they said in El Nino is that some areas get cooler, some areas get drier, some areas get warmer, colder, um, have more rain, less rain. It causes impact and changes of these environments, and they're pretty dramatic. So I want you to think about this question. You might want to jot down some notes um, but, or pause it and think about this, this question here. And so during El Nino years, why is the Christchurch New Zealand temperature cooler? I come up with these three claims that will help us um, understand um, temperature better and how it changes. Claim one, the amount of incoming energy from the sun is changes. This is stating that the sun is either giving more or less energy. Claim two, something about the earth's surface, land or water changes. And now when they're talking about surface, they're talking about just the top layers. And this was actually quite um, important in our last unit with weather patterns the idea that there was more surface water changed the amount of rain. So that's what they're talking about, like differences in, in the amount of land and water. And then claim three, something about the air changes. So saying that the air itself is changing, causing there to be a temperature change. Keep in mind when we take temperature, we test the air temperature, not necessarily the ground temperature. So the next thing we're going to do is go into the sim. And again, so you should have handed in next activity. And we have moved on to, you always, you always want to click the next button on the bottom because that will make sure all your work gets handed in. So this is where we are right now. And we are working on our claims. What I would like you guys to do is actually to choose a claim and then press next. So again, you should go back into amplify and choose your claim. And now we're going into the sim, which I already have open, but you would click this blue button and it would bring you right to the sim, or you can go through the three dots and go to Ocean, Atmosphere, and Climate Simulation. And it should bring you here. So again, if you don't want to explore on your own and you just want to get through the lesson, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, but if you want to pause here, this will be a good time to just explore what's going on here. So some of the key features that I want to bring out is that there's a menu bar. Menu bar shows you that there's a current map and not, and when they say current, they're talking about um, like movement of water or air, like wind current or water current. Wind map, energy test, surface test. Then up here we have temperature. We can do air, surface, or none. Down here, we have location sensors. They only let you choose two places at one time. And there are about seven or eight markers on the continents here. And it shows you what's going on. You also have current speed, which I'm gonna go into the play mode to show you what exactly they mean by this. This is no movement in the current these white dots, as I get higher in my movement, it shows a more, a different current speed. Then we have, we can test the air current or the surface current. So this would be the water or the, and stuff like that. Notice that the current only moves in the water and not on these continents here, which is an interesting idea. If I turn off the sun, there seems to be no movement at all. That's another interesting idea. Or if I reverse it, 
what happens. So these are just some of the features here. I would also like to go into the energy test, which is actually where we're going to do our simulator. And this has land and water and not too many other functions. So I'm adding energy. Remember that Earth gets about 90% of its energy directly from the sun. So when I'm adding energy, it's most likely going to come from sunlight. But then let's look at this. It reverses direction. So that's another thing you might want to pay attention to. Now, what am I asking you to do during this portion? So I'm going to stay in the water surface one for this experiment. If I want to increase the temperature, I added energy, right? I'm at the max. So let me start from, let me restart and go back to water. If I wanted to add energy to make the temperature increase, I need to add energy. We know that our energy, that thermal energy is temperature. So if I'm adding energy, which I get from the sun, I have to increase. Now, how do I remove energy? How do I decrease the temperature? I remove the energy here. And that makes it go down. But the direction of energy is still moving because remember, we cannot create or destroy energy. So I would like you guys to go back to your curriculum for Amplify. And here, how did we increase temperature? I added more energy. And how did you decrease? I removed energy, which this seems quite easy since we know that the energy for temperature comes from somewhere. And if 90% of the temperature on Earth comes from the sun, that if I added more energy from the sun, I added temperature. So just keep this in mind. Um, it's not going to be a full explanation, but it's going to help us in our next couple of lessons. So I'm going to go back to our slides. Now, our chapter question so again, we have our unit question, which is what determines the air temperature of a location on Earth? But our unit, I'm sorry, our chapter, which is only chapter one, our question is what determines the air temperature of Christchurch, New Zealand? So we're going to be focusing on this, this area, this town. And again, we found ways to increase. We found ways to decrease. You don't have partners because we're not with anyone. But I want to point out two vocabulary words that we've had for a long time. Energy, the ability to make things move or change. Energy has been a vocabulary word in every single unit. So if you don't know it by now, I would write this one down. And temperature the measure of how hot or cold something is. We're talking about temperature of location, so we're going to have to remember some of our ideas of thermal energy, but not necessarily the math part, but the concepts, the idea of where energy comes from and how energy moves in thermal. If you're nervous, don't be. It's going to be much easier than, than that unit. So that's the end of this lesson. Um, Again, I'm going to go here. Always click next activity and you're done. The homework you do not need to submit on here because I already sent it to you as a reading quiz. So you do not need to answer these over here. Um, you could, it won't affect anything. You press hand in. Always make sure you um, click on the red button. Now, a key concept that I forgot to mention in the beginning of the video, if you are a Spanish speaker, 
you can click here and it will turn everything into Spanish. All of the questions will be in Spanish. So you have a choice of either doing it in English or Spanish. Thanks, guys, and talk to you soon.